This is the Intuitive Leadership Mastery Podcast. What would it take for you to double your profits and half your stress with your intuition? Learn how with your host, Michael Light. Welcome back to the show. I'm here today with Chris Sparks, and he is the future best-selling author of the playbook, Self-Programming for Peak Performance. And he is also ranked in the top 20 in the world, and that's out of 100 million people who play poker. He was number 20 in the world playing poker. And he is used to playing for high stakes, winning and losing the cost of a car on a single turn of a card, which is pretty intense, I would have thought, and great preparation for high stakes business deals. So we have a lot of interesting subjects coming up in this podcast. We're going to look at key insights in achieving your goals in less time, why getting clear on your goals is key versus just pounding away working at them, and why sprinting as fast as you can in the wrong direction is clearly a bad idea, particularly if it's based on numbers that have no meaning behind them. Also, we'll look at what to do if you know you should be doing something in your business, but you don't do it. And I'm going to raise my hand here. I've done that myself. And I, we're going to learn how Chris helps people fix that. Um, the importance of speed and intensity of decision making in top poker and business. And we're going to look at how you can tell someone is bluffing in a business deal, which uh, could be really valuable information uh, if you've got a business deal coming up. And how Chris gets messages from his intuition and how he uses his intuition when he's helping his clients achieve peak performance. So welcome, Chris. Thanks, Michael. Good to be here. So let's start by talking about key insights in achieving your goals in less time, because I'm sure every business leader and entrepreneur would love to get their goals achieved faster. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it all begins with knowing where you're heading, where if you're not sure where you want to go, you can go in any particular direction. It doesn't really matter. So the first thing that I always do with friends and clients is help them uh, get clear on where they want to be. And that begins with what do you want to do in your life? Uh, I think the the obituaries of any great man or any great woman could be condensed down to one sentence. So once you have that sentence you can work backward, backwards from, all of your actions will kind of fit in line. And you realize that most of what you're doing from day to day is not really going to be a part of that narrative and thus might not, may, or not, may or may not be essential. Well, what's the one sentence going to be on your obituary, Chris? <laughs> oh, I like to think that I'm still writing that. I think my working title is uh, Chris Sparks, Advancer of Humanity. And likely, uh, luckily, that leaves me a lot of uh, room to work as far as the uh, specifics. I, I like that. So you mentioned it's important not just to pound away on your goals, you know, going fast in the wrong direction. Um, do you see that happening a lot with entrepreneurs? Absolutely. I think in this culture, there's a lot of emphasis on putting in a lot of hours or, you know, these productivity hacks that can help you work smarter. But there's not enough attention put on, are you doing the right thing? And usually that comes down to, are you doing the thing that scares you? I think there's mm. far too much thought on, you know, how can I get more hours into the day? Should I be sleeping less? Should I, am I spending too much time on my meals? Uh, should, do I need to cut down on the number of calls I'm doing where there's not enough time or thought into the planning as far as like, what is the most important thing that I can be doing now? What's the thing that's going to really move my business forward? What is the roadblock that's most limiting me from growing my business and reaching more customers? There's not enough of these asking the hard questions and doing the hard things that really drive the business forward. And I think that's where the real opportunity lies. Now, I, I like that thing. How can I do the task that scares me the most? But why is it important that in our business we do that first? Sure. I, here I like the, the use of the term the resistance, where the resistance keys us to what we should be doing. Uh, and I try to use fear as my guide a little bit as far as what I do, because I know 
that I need to over adjust for that fear um, because it's going, the fear is going to kind of cause me to flinch away. But if I lean into that, it's going to kind of adjust in the sense of them doing more what I want to do. So I think a lot of times fear causes us to overlook things that need to be fixed. A question that I like to ask clients a lot is, what are you merely tolerating? And it's this idea of cognitive dissonance where we can either change our actions or change our beliefs. We have this kind of uh, internal conflict. And the, usually the easiest way to do this is we protect the status quo by changing our belief about it. We say, this is fine. I really cue into this word fine, that this is something that probably should be changed, but it's much easier to think that it's okay so I don't have to do anything about it. And usually when we kind of peel back these layers of fear, this is where the opportunity lies. So what, what do you, what's your definition of fear then? You know. Hmm. Definitions are hard. I think my, my first instinct that comes to me when I describe it is fear is a failure to look closely. I think it's, it's usually a distortion. I, I like this idea that it comes from cognitive behavioral therapy of a cognitive distortion that fear causes us to see reality not as it really is, but as we would like it to be. And that by looking past the fear, we can get better in touch with this true reality. Um, it's something I talk a lot about with clients is how can you have this level of awareness? How can you get past this tendency to avoid the things that scare us and face reality as it really is? So that's, that re reminds me of uh, the fear acronym false evidence appearing real, which um, sounds similar to that that we're not seeing the real reality we're, we've got this emotion coming up anxiety or fear and because of that we're, we're not taking bold action in our business i like that and just why you know you said go towards the fear which i think is a wonderful thing uh, you know, assuming you're not lost in the jungle and there are lions around, you know, you're, you're just in a business and you're dealing with business situations that you've got some fear, fear on. Um, why, why is going towards where the most fear produce the best results? Sure. I, I love the lion in the jungle metaphor. Uh, for those who are listening, I, I get a lot of my mental models from evolutionary psychology that, you know, we're an outdated machine. We're basically programmed on meat, 10,000 years old, haven't been updated since then. And all of these fears that helped us survive in the savanna uh, no longer serve us, that we are outdated to our new uh, environments. And I think it was that the number one fear people have is of public speaking, which clearly isn't rational but when you think that we kind of evolved in these hunter-gatherer tribes where having a bad speech in front of the tribe could cause us to be ostracized and sent away into the wild it makes a little bit more sense so when i say running into the fear it's correcting for these deep grown biases that have been hard coded into us, which no longer serve us because the environment that we were built in is no longer the environment that we live in. I, I like that. The idea that we're running an old human operating system, we're running human 1.0 and, and really we're up to 6.7 or, or whatever the modern society uh, requires. So you, you help people to upgrade their their way of behaving so they can be way more successful in the current business situation sure i think the metaphor carries a lot of weight if you think about things like habits we'll talk about bad habits uh things that are super stimuli so you know the dopamine cycles like checking facebook 
or having food that's really sugary and fatty because, you know, back on the savanna, it was hard to find those kind of sources of nutrition. So our body caused them to taste very good. So we would seek them out, but that now that food is abundant, uh, that's no longer needed. And it's something that I talk a lot about is there's this kind of hesitation around being vulnerable and authentic around your struggles, particularly as an entrepreneur, because there's this idea that there's something wrong with me. There's why aren't I able to do this? But when it's realization that you're literally fighting against your genes, you're fighting against nature and how you were built and trying to reprogram yourself in this way, it makes a lot of sense why creating a new habit, why shedding an old bad habit can be very difficult because evolutionarily, it was best for this to be so, where we're fighting our genes. Uh, there's this idea of, um, I don't want to say idea, it's actually a scientific concept of homeostasis, where the body tries to maintain status quo uh, biochemically. And what this means is that anytime you're trying to do, do a new diet, uh, your body is going to be very resistant to that because you're trying to trying to change the status quo in your body, which historically is a negative thing. So you have this negative feedback loop that kicks in and tries to restore that status quo. Um, you see these processes, these negative feedback loops all over in our bodies that try to prevent us from making these changes. And that's why behavioral change is really hard because this resistance is really ingrained. It's hardwired within us. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in, in caveman society, you know, change could be dangerous. Um, or in village society, you know, change could be socially dangerous. So there is that resistance to, to change. But in, in modern business and all the technology stuff, the, the speed of change is so fast these days that if you aren't, aren't able to change fast, you're going to be not winning in your business. Absolutely. I think... I think a key mental model as an entrepreneur is this idea of speed of implementation. How quickly can you make decisions and implement them in that there's always in the days of like abundance of information on the internet, there's always going to be more research that can be done. There's always going to be more clients you can talk to, to get feedback, but it's all about getting things out there and creating these tight feedback loops so that you can, um, you can implement things really quickly. I, I love the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, this is uh, from John Boyd. He was a military theorist. It's called the OODA loop, OODA loop. So it's you beat your opponents on the battlefield by running through the loop faster. So it's observing, orienting, acting, and deciding. And the quicker that you can orient yourself to this environment, the quicker that you can make these decisions and act upon them, uh, the faster you will be getting feedback on those new decisions. And you will literally outrun your competitors by going through the loop faster. So it's less about uh, kind of over debilitating on these really trivial decisions, but rather making the best decision given the imperfect information that we have and moving on and course correcting as we go. So just, you know, I, I have read about that OODD loop and, you know, in the military sense, that's doing two things. One is it's, it's getting the information quickly. It's, it's making quick decisions. You know, so if you're, if you're two fighter pilots, the one that can turn inside the other, is the one who shoots the, the second pilot down. Or if it's two armies fighting, the one that can cr cr create the fog of war and confusion to the other enemy while they have clarity of information on what the opposing side is doing is the one that can win um, the battle, uh, which you know is what some analysts said happened in Vietnam, that you know the American military in Vietnam had all kinds of advantages, but they lost because they were slower on this loop. Absolutely. Uh, my, my favorite metaphor is the metaphor of the map and the territory, where the map is our model of reality. So in the example you give, the opponent, if you're moving faster, is making decisions based upon an outdated map because their model of you has already changed, whereas you're acting closer to the reality of the situation. Uh, this, this comes up time and time again in poker play, 
where you have a metagame, which is the game within the game. So you have levels of strategy. So if you think about a simplistic example like rock, paper, scissors, uh, level one is I go rock. I don't care what you choose. I choose rock because I like rocks. Uh, level two thinking would be, uh, I know you like rock, so I'm going to go paper. Level three is, I know that you know that I like rock, and though you're, so you're probably going to go paper, so I'm going to go scissors. And you can have infinite levels of this metagame, and the way that you win is by being on a different level than your opponent thinks you are, ideally being one above, but sometimes being one level below, so that you can um, get inside their, their loop. And that's referring to to game theory, you know, the whole mathematics of how do you win at games and is there a, a strategy that is perfect for the game or is there an imperfect strategy? And, you know, in a lot, lot of games like poker or in business, we have incomplete information. There is no best strategy. Um, you know, there's no perfect strategy, but there are things you can do like the speed of decisions that gives you a winning uh, strategy and tactics. Sure. The way that I think of intuition within poker is just accumulated experience that's readily accessible. So the more decisions that I make, the more feedback I get on those decisions. So not did I win the hand, but I had these assumptions going into the uh, going into the hand, and this was the result. Are any of these assumptions that I had invalid, and thus I need to update my model of this player or of this situation as it com comes up in poker? And the closer that my models are to the reality, the better that I can make these future decisions. So each decision that I make improves the quality of my future decisions um, in that sense. So applying this to business, if, if your company is able to make decisions quickly, even if they're intense decisions that are totally pivoting the business and your competitors uh, are deciding stuff slower and implementing stuff slower, you're going to win the competition. Sure. I think there are very few decisions that are true inflection points, and a lot of this drama is self-created. But when you are really at one of these points, say it's uh, making your first early hire or pivoting the business or taking on a new investor, uh, it's crucial that you look at things in a rational fashion, that you're getting all of your um, decision criteria down into paper so you can evaluate them in turn. And then it's given the information that you have, like where does your intuition lead you? I, I like to kind of bridge this gap by um, a, an example I'll do is I, I have this exercise where I lead clients through as far as picking which project to focus on first. Uh, there's this kind of existential quagmire we get ourselves into where we take on a new project and every day it's like, oh, did I make the new decision? I should have done the other one. I don't know how much I'm really enjoying this. Is this going to work out? But you get around this by picking a set experimental period that you're going to choose one option and stick to that. I, I like the time period of 30 or even better 90 days to give the experiment enough time to run. But in order to choose that one option, you need to look at all the options you have available and have some sort of rational calculation on which one is the best one to go. So it's what are all the criteria that you'll use to make your decision and how important do you think each of these criteria is. And the interesting thing is once you've listed out all these criteria on how well each um, criteria is scored for each option, sometimes the best score doesn't lead to what you decide. But getting all of those numbers onto the page will kind of cue you into where you're leading. Just like trying to put a number on where your intuition is leading you will help you and kind of answer the call and like hear above all the noise that you were um, that you were having a hard time overhearing. Uh, it's, uh, I like, I like in uh, intuition, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the focusing technique. This is from uh, Eugene Jenlin. And he talks about this idea of a handle. It's like handle is something that you can grab onto. And, but you can't have a handle to grab onto until you have all of your options for it. So it's trying to get this decision down to like a word or an image, something that all of the other criteria will fit around. And then once you understand, okay, these are the important things, you can start to form an image around that.
Mm. So a few things there that come to me. First of all, um, you've probably come across Taylor Pearson's 90-day planning cycles um, that he's popularized where you, 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 know, you re-evaluate every 90 days and have a vague goal and then you identify tasks that are going to get you moving towards that vague goal um, and then be totally okay at the end of 90 days that if some particular task you know like suppose your task was creating a podcast and you give it all your best for 90 days but then at the end of the 90 days you reevaluate am i enjoying this is it getting results do i want to do it again and be okay it's just an experiment you know you don't have to be locked into going in the wrong direction super fast like you were talking about earlier. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of Taylor's process there. I think he's excellent at systems thinking. And yeah, I definitely look at that 90-day model as a good example where you need to separate out this decision and the execution of it. And creating this closed container of an experiment, I really like that word, allows you to separate the information gathering and the testing of assumptions from the making of the decision. And this allows you to actually give the decision um, the chance it needs to win, right? Whereas if you're constantly thinking about whether you should pivot within that 90 days, you're not going to know whether you gave it its full chance to win. Yeah, because if we always are going after the next bright, shiny object, you know, none of the objects have a chance to succeed. Absolutely. So you mentioned putting a number on your intuition. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I was super clear on the exercise, but in essence, it's... Uh, it's two parts. One, what are all of the criteria that I want to use to make this decision? So say I'm considering between business projects I want to do, um, it'd probably be something like impact, uh, exposure, uh, how much will I enjoy it? How hard will it be? Do I have access to people who have done it similar, right? And coming up with different criteria for Let's say moving to a new city, it's all the things you're looking for in a city, like access to airports, access to entrepreneurs, uh, things to do, cost, et cetera. Listing out all the things that could be important to you and then looking at your options and ranking them on how they do on each score. And the most important part of this exercise isn't the final score that you get, but in forcing yourself to consider in turn uh, how each option does on your criteria. And it's this, mm. this process of putting a number on it that actually makes this decision much easier. It's kind of like, I forget which movie it was. It was, uh, I, it was I decide things by flipping a coin, not by how the coin lands, but when the coin's in the air, I know which one I'm rooting for, right? Mm. Now, now that you have a number on it, you can kind of get a feel for where you're leaning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that sounds similar to the technique I've used where I put a, a, a number zero to 10 on, on something, you know, where zero is it sucks for me and 10 is it's wonderful. And then mm -hmm. I play around with the numbers I get. I mean, I might put them in a spreadsheet and score the different options if I'm picking a city. Um, but I also might, you, you know, ask, you know, if a certain city is, is a six out of 10, but for various reasons, emotional reasons, I, I'd like to go there you know, what would it take to make it a seven out of 10 for me in this time period? Uh, and maybe I can get inspiration on how to improve the, the quality of life there. So I think there's a lot of power in using numbers. That reminds me of a, a similar example, a technique that I use a lot in my coaching is a pre-mortem. So what I do is I'll say, like, pretend, let's say we're, we're setting a new morning routine. And the question will be, okay, 0% uh, to 100%. Uh, we're talking again in a week. And you say, I haven't done my morning routine once. Like, how surprised are you? And if you say something like, okay, I'm 100% surprised, then okay, that's probably a pretty solid routine and we can move on. But if you could say like, oh, like I'm 20 or 30% surprised, as in like, if I don't do it at all, I wouldn't be that surprised. Clearly mm -hmm. there's like some more work we need to do on planning that out. So it might be okay, like 
let's hit, let's just brainstorm on a set of two minutes <laughs> timer. Uh, mm-hmm. What are some things you could do to take that 30% surprise up to 50%, right? Make it mm-hmm. more likely. Do. So say it's something like meditation. Okay, maybe you don't have a good place to sit. So getting a nice cushion to sit. Maybe it's choosing the app that you want to use and setting the notification now or having an accountability buddy who's going to do it with you, right? Or like numerous things you can do immediately in the next two minutes that'll, that'll increase that. But you can kind of predict the future in that way in that you're, you're simulating uh, scenarios where it didn't go as planned. And thinking about, oh, okay, that's really interesting. Like, how many of these hypothetical scenarios does that occur? And it's like, okay, mm. I'm, not, I'm not surprised that that happened. And it's okay, how can we create scenarios where you are surprised when you fail? So putting, putting a number on that really kind of accesses this, like, how confident are you? I, I love how you do that and how you can use the number you get and then play around with it to see how you can bump it up. And that you're reading your surprise level in the future by doing a pre-mortem. So that's it's, it's pre pre hindsight or kind of using your inner simulator. Uh, the idea that you don't need to make mistakes in real time. That I think your your future behavior is somewhat deterministic, and that you can kind of shape the river, if you will, and that water flows downhill. So. Thinking about, okay, I know myself, I know what it's going to be like. Uh, is there a way to get my future self to do what I want them to do? An um, interesting finding from neuroscience is that we think about our future self as if we're thinking about a stranger. So it'd be very difficult to be very empathetic towards yourself in the future. But it also means that you can kind of be, take the outside view on your behavior uh, where it'd be like, oh, well, that idiot, myself in the future, he's going to be tired or he's going to have this excuse or he's, he's going to wake up too late and not have not have enough time. It, it makes it easier to be objective about your future behavior because you're not you're not tying in your identity with it. You're you're kind of allowing yourself to take that outside view, and what that allows is you can kind of make some of these mistakes without actually making them. I, I love that way of looking at it, and it, it reminds me of a, a quote from uh, Yoda, that Star Wars character, where he said, "There is no try. There's only do or not do," and so often when we make changes to habits we say oh yeah i'll try and meditate and that's Mm -hmm. nothing like as powerful as saying as i will meditate and then thinking through that exercise you just said where you're like well how what percentage um, do i believe i'll be surprised if i don't meditate in a week Uh, and that's taking away the try option there's a lot of power in language right there the the idea of try, right? There's no, there's no try, there's only do. So when you hear kind of this weasel out language that, that kind of gives yourself an out, you know, it's, like, oh, well, it's, it's okay that I didn't do it, I tried to do it. Like be, paying attention to the way that you describe things, you can kind of get at this internal resistance that might cause you not to be able to do it in the future. Where you're, like you, like I said, like you know yourself very well, and when you listen to yourself give give these outs, that kind of I, I like to think about like our mind is we like to we like to think that we're this prime minister sitting above you know, a board of directors, and we're just directing all of our actions. But really, our conscious is just this, like, right-hand man who's really creepy sitting next to the king saying, like, a very judicious choice, sire. Uh, It's like Richard Feynman said, you know, we must be very careful not to fool ourselves because we're very easy to fool. That a lot of our actions are geared towards kind of protecting our ego and saying, oh, we tried, it's okay, we'll get it next time. But if we listen to ourselves and the language that we use and the patterns of our thought, we can prevent this because we can kind of catch ourselves rationalizing and weaseling out in advance and take steps to prevent that. I, I totally agree the power of language. And I'm going to double down on that thought and say, not only do I want to catch using the word try and other weasel words in my own languaging, I want to catch it in my staff and my clients. Um, you know, if a staff person says, I'll try and get that report to you, you know, for Thursday, you know, are you going to do it or you're not? And if, <laughs> if it's not likely to happen because other stuff's going on, let's talk about that now. So we can either reprioritize your other tasks 
or I can pick someone else to take care of this task that I need for that date, or I can shift the date because Thursday doesn't actually matter to me. It's kind of arbitrary. Um, and the same with clients, you know, I'll, I'll try and get your payment to you this month. You know, I, I don't know how many of us have heard that kind of <laughs> sentence, which, which goes along with the checks in the mail, if you're still getting checks and not electronic payments. Um, and, and just being sensitive to that uh, and then gently questioning. It's incredibly powerful. I really like that. Yeah, specifics drive communication that a lot of a lot of miscommunication comes from failures to be specific that one person thinks the context was such a way, but without this being specific, so saying, okay, by the end of Thursday, unless such and such, right? Giving giving very specific one or zero type criteria for something is going to happen. Like everyone knows what's going on, but it's when this ambiguity is introduced that uh, it's, it's kind of the, what's, I forget the name of the law, but it's that, you know, never attribute to malice what can be contributed to laziness or stupidity, right? Just that, um, we will find a way to get out of anything if we can, that incentives are meant to be gamed. So making things very clear can kind of prevent some of these fires from taking place in the future. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking out, out loud here, you know, the, the, the competitor in the World Tournament of Poker who was trying to win, how did they do in the rankings compared to someone who was actually, that they, they were committed to winning? Man, I could get into this so much, but in poker, mental game is huge. Uh, you need to have this mindset that you're going to win every time you sit down. And rationally, you know that this can't be the case. So in my example, in my online play, 52% of the times that I sat down, I won. But that means 48% of the time that I lost. And all of the money that I made is in this 4% delta. And in maximizing the times that I win, when things are going well, like doubling down metaphorically, and when I'm losing, limiting my losses, right? Not chasing after them. But in my mind, I have to kind of compartmentalize this and sit down every time expecting to win, treating every decision as the opportunity to make the perfect decision, right? Not taking any of them off. And I think this applies in entrepreneurship as well as um, I'm writing, I mentioned um, I'm writing a book right now, which has been a very interesting meta process, uh, particularly when I'm writing chapters on procrastination um, and trying to prevent myself from procrastinate. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's, it's trying to harvest this subconscious, and I don't know what's going to come out when I sit down. It's these, these concepts that I've really internalized trying to translate them into terms that everybody can understand as I'm doing this in this conversation right now. And some days, like it just flows really easily and I can write five pages in an hour and it's great. I don't need to look over it. And then other times I'm just staring at the page and I get out a paragraph in a few hours and it's just complete garbage. But the problem is when I sit down, I don't really know. So I have to treat every day as like, okay, I'm going to be brilliant. I'm going to come up with ideas that no one has ever said before in productivity, which is pretty hard. And it's just going to be marvelous and take whatever comes like as a learning experience. And that's, that's what every setback is, is a lesson. So um, tying it back to poker, like the days that it doesn't go well, not looking at it as a failure because you need to absorb those lessons that happen and make them into being a better player and get back into the mind state that you're going to sit down the next day. It doesn't matter if you've lost five or 10 days in a row, but you're going to sit down as if like there's a hundred percent chance you're going to win. And it's that, that separation that I think really separated the good players from the great players is this idea of showing up. Um, something I always like to say in my poker coaching days is that 
I never was one of the best players. Uh, I, I think a lot of people I'd play with would say the same, but I played my A game a very large percent of the time. I was very disciplined. And it's not the quality of your A game, but how often you're playing it. So as an entrepreneur, like how often are you showing up? It doesn't matter if occasionally you just have like a crazy peak day. Um, you, you do 10 out of 10, and, but like the next week you're operating at a two or a three out of 10 to recover from that or coming down from that that high or you're like oh I had an amazing day on Thursday I can just take the rest of the weekend off uh, but it's like can you show up and be consistent day after day because like any given day you don't know what's going to happen you have to kind of create that opportunity for magic to happen well and I think there's that famous quote by Woody Allen where he said 80% of success is showing up uh, and you know he's a very successful movie maker author jazz clarinetist goodness knows what else um, and I think most successful people, whether they're poker players, entrepreneurs, sports people, you've just got to show up and practice a lot of the time. There's a lot of wisdom in common wisdom. Yeah. And the other thing that, that I'm curious about, when you say harvesting your subconscious, it, it sort of implies that almost the, the words you're writing in the book or the business ideas you're coming up with, they, they almost existed ahead of time in your subconscious and you just have to access them. Yeah, a lot of writers talk about this and I had never experienced it until recently of just being a conduit where I'm trying not to judge what I write, but just kind of write what comes to mind as I think particularly in productivity, there's so much content out there that's very, a very low value, these tips and tricks, which, I mean, anyone who's consumed all this productivity porn knows that it doesn't really lead to results. So it's how can I generate unique insights in a field that is so littered with noise? And a lot of that comes with not judging what I think is important, but just kind of writing what comes to me and then ending it later. Uh, and I think the tough part about this is a lot of these things are just kind of assumed, like I've so internalized them that to put them into words is very difficult. But I, I know from experience that it's extremely rewarding, both personally and to others. Uh, a huge part of my poker success back in the day was that I was coaching players who, was, who were one step below me, where, you know, I, I think we... Uh, I don't know if we talked about like how many tables I was playing at a time. Um, when I was playing low stakes, I was playing 30 tables at a time online. Um, even at high stakes, it was usually 10 to 12. What this means is that I'm making a decision every one to two seconds for like eight to 12 hours on end. And that means that I need to have these concepts, these situations super accessible. But how I was able to do that is I'm talking about these same situations and concepts day after day to my students so that like I can access them really quickly and I can move on and kind of chunk these trivial decisions into smaller periods of time so that when a unique scenario comes up, I have more time to dedicate to that. And the same thing I think is true with this productivity coaching that I'm talking about a lot of these best practices, my clients uh, using kind of divergent thinking and bringing it up in a lot of different ways and trying to apply it to a lot of different businesses because you know everyone's doing different things. And all these different ways of looking at the same problem of how do we set goals? How do we create habits and routines? How do we maximize our focus and energy and time every day? How do we break out when we inevitably just fall into a rut? And approaching the problem from all these different ways has made all of this information really accessible to me. And then it's just a matter of translating it, being that conduit to get it onto the page so that hopefully I'm, I'm kind of distilling some uh, universal principles that people can use regardless of what business they're in, regardless of what their day-to-day -day looks like, that hopefully there's some actionable things for them. I, I definitely had that experience when I was writing my book that some days... You know, I was writing the book. Other days, the book was writing me and the material <laughs> just flowed out. And whatever I could do to identify, okay, do, do, does that more likely happen in the morning or late at night? Is it better when I'm alone or in a cafe? You know, you can, we can both go through the intuitive route and channeling the information, but we can also use our rational mind to like study, okay, when do we get 
the easiest creation in our business, whether it's writing or creating ideas for our business or whatever it is. And uh, one book I got that from was uh, 2,000 to 10,000, which is about how to write 10,000 words a day instead of 2,000 words a day. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of that is about analyzing those kind of factors uh, and also planning out the writing ahead of time. You know, we don't have to just listen to the muse. We can have the muse talk to us ahead of time, you know, kind of outline the section and then come back and write it, which is sort of similar to the idea in getting things done. That There are multiple versions of ourselves. There's like the robot person that just turns out words, but there's the planning person who decides what tasks we're going to do. And then there's the creative person who comes up with brilliant new ideas. And these are all different aspects of our personality and they all operate best in different environments and different times of day. Well said. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of the paradigms that we see happening in productivity now where the realization that all these different moods, all these modes of thinking are parts of us that are our emotions kind of guide what's going on and that true productivity comes with internal coherence when all of these different voices feel like they're being heard, that you utilizing all these different parts of yourself that they're kind of recipes that you need all of these different viewpoints in order to create a coherent story. Uh, so I, I like this. I like this idea that you're talking about that you need to incorporate all of them to have a finished product, no matter what you're doing. And you know, this ties into the work you do, which is so important: helping other entrepreneurs to achieve their peak performance and how to shift their habits. And, you know, when you want to shift a habit, you talked about thinking about, you know, how you could be not surprised that it, you know, failed or didn't fail in the future. Are there any other visualizing things you do to to make habits happen better? So real briefly on the the science of a habit, uh, the habit loop is where it's all based off of. I think about everything in terms of leverage. So this means you have three points of leverage in a habit. So that's your, I'll use the three R's. You have your reminder, you have your routine, and you have your reward. So reminder is what starts the loop in, in, uh, it's what starts it off. It's what literally reminds you to start it. Um, the routine is the habit itself. The reward is what reinforces the habit. It's what get it, gets you coming back to do it time and time again. We don't stick with our habits for our long-term benefits. We stick for them to uh, we stick to them for our uh, short-term rewards, like the uh, the feeling of accomplishment that we get. Um, literally, you know, after a workout, we feel better. It's it it's this feeling and kind of internalizing it let's say you're meditating and you feel more relaxed and focused afterwards that's what keeps you coming back to the habit time and time again so you have Mm. these three levers you can make your reminders stronger more prevalent more salient you can make the routine easier and more streamlined to do i think that's that comes into play we were talking about the level of surprise and how can you make it how can you make yourself less surprised that you make it through the habit? And usually that's removing these trivial inconveniences or potential excuses that can come up that we anticipate in advance. And then getting really in touch with the reward. So how does it make us feel afterwards? Um, why are we doing this? What's, what's, what's the choice that's driving it? And is all of these levers that come into play. And when we're not doing a habit, we can use this framework to see which part of it we want to emphasize first. I, I just love how you're using reminder, routine, and reward, habit reinforcement there, Chris. And so many of us in business don't use rewards when we're working on habits ourselves. We instead punish ourselves, which is so counterproductive in forming a habit. I try to stay away from punishment whenever possible. Uh, I think all goals should be refra- should be framed as approach goals. So even something as bad as taxes can be framed in a really positive way as far as, okay, I want to get clarity into the finances of my business. Um, are there, am I paying too much? Uh, 
are there places for opportunity here? Um, and looking at it as an opportunity to kind of gain knowledge and perspective on your business and where your money is going, rather than like, this is a mindless task that you have to do. So how can you frame everything you're doing into something that you want to do? And then in the context of habits, like, willpower is going to be drained any time that you're relying on this kind of compliance attitude that you're doing this because you have to. And I try to come at everything as if I have a choice. Like I have the choice to sit on the beach in Thailand for the rest of my life and, you know, panhandle and be a beach bum and just hang out. Like I freely have that choice, but Doing taxes is part of my current reality because I choose to build a business and I choose to try to make it big and reach people and have it professional and streamlined. And I accept the costs of the things that aren't fun and aren't enjoyable, that aren't as cool as sitting on a beach all day because they are part of this larger vision. And it's what do I want? Like, how do I approach it? And then accepting the costs that come along with it because they're part of this larger vision. Uh, so I think, I think framing and in that context, reframing negative things is really important as far as maintaining momentum over time. I, I love that reframe to I choose and eliminating any I have to, I must to, I ought to, I shoulds from our business because they are just total energy drains. Thinking I must do my taxes, it, it kind of puts me off wanting to even start it. Um, yeah, um, I think I think motivation is lost all the time when we're beating ourselves down for our setbacks and for things that we fail to do. Um, and I think that everything in life can be framed into two categories. I mentioned before, every setback, every failure is a lesson. And anything that happens to us is a gift. So how can we accept this gift? How can we celebrate it? And how can we take any setback and turn into a lesson that we pay for once? We don't want to be repaying our tuition. And in the same way, like every setback is an opportunity to improve. And that's a gift in itself. It, it is a gift. And seeing it from gratitude is. And, and there's something I remember reading in a book on procrastination, and I'll have to look up the name of the book later, but it, instead of kind of saying, I must do this really terrible task that's going to be a struggle and hard, it's like I choose to get started in an easy way on this task, and I'm just going to you know experiment and play with it. Um, and it's just total change in energy I have for doing the task, whether it's taxes or firing a, a staff member who's not a fit or, or whatever it is that we've been putting off. I talk about procrastination a ton with clients, mostly because I used to identify as a perpetual procrastinator back in the day. Um, I mean, like many, I would just wait till the very last minute, particularly on essays. Uh, and I normally felt like I got away with it, which was the worst part because I never faced the consequences. But obviously, it was never as good as it needed to be. I didn't give any ideas. I didn't give my ideas the chance to marinate, and it was kind of like just shipped out at the last minute. Uh, I think anyone who's listening to this uh, would really benefit for looking at what's called the procrastination equation that comes from Pierre Steele. Uh, the summary is that you have these four points of leverage uh, anytime you're procrastinating. And the equation is that mo motivation equals, and on the positive side, expectancy times value. Right, so expectancy, how can you make it more likely that you're going to succeed as far as your perception? Um, anything you could do now to make the success more likely. And then value, how can you increase the value of what you're doing, either long-term uh, as far as connecting it to your long-term goals or short-term as far as how can you make it more enjoyable? And usually that's increasing difficulty rather than decreasing difficulty. On the uh, inverse side, it's uh, impulsiveness times delay. So delay, again, with reward, uh, this usually comes down to breaking your, a large project into smaller pieces, into milestones. So you can enjoy and celebrate these small wins of, let's say, um, you know, where I'm writing the book, I celebrate every section that I write or I celebrate every paragraph I write. And I try to build in this reinforcement that builds momentum along the way. With impulsiveness, I think so much of productivity comes down to creating constraints. Uh, a lot of people think constraints as negatives, but you take what you want to do 
and you create constraints that prevent yourself from doing the other things. So all things that are impulsive, like um, internet distractions, interruptions, uh, not being able to focus, usually these are failures to set boundaries and constraints more than anything else. And if you eliminate your other options, uh, generally you're left with the option you want to do. Um, the, the best example I give of this is when I wanted to meditate in the morning, and this applies to writing as well, I eliminate all my other options. So I sit in a room with just a desk and my journal, and there's nothing I can do for that half hour other than write. I can sit there and just stare at the blank page and daydream for a half hour, but like I don't have access to my computer. I, there's nothing else I can do. And eventually I get bored enough that I might as well write. And I think the same kind of applies is how can you eliminate the other options so you can focus on the important one? I, I think that's so important. I learned that or relearned it at a Focus 55, which for those who haven't come across it is uh, 55 hours of focusing on one project or goal uh, together with another group of people who are all focusing on their own goals. And one of the things I learned is I, I need to close my email, close Facebook, close any other programs on the computer and just have open the things I need to get the tasks done. And the other thing that's helped me a lot is playing music that doesn't have words, you know, techno or some other music that's upbeat and just keeps that monkey part of my brain that wants to be distracted, occupied. So um, definitely important. And, and also, I just want to echo that thing about rewarding ourselves when we're doing some project that, you know, maybe big, like writing a book or creating a new product for a company or, or whatever the thing is that rewards are so important. And that's one of the reasons masterminds work so well. If you're in a mastermind with other uh, people doing similar things, whether it's an entrepreneurial mastermind or it's a health weight loss mastermind or, or whatever the group is, getting those small rewards as you take steps in the right direction, it, you know, is important. And I, I don't know if you have a Facebook group for the your book, um, Chris, or but I, I did that and just telling people, oh, I wrote so many words today or here's the challenge I overcame, that was really motivating. Yeah, that's a, a key part of the book is I'm creating a private community where everyone can kind of share what they've gotten out of it and I can go in there and answer specific questions, um, hopefully apply the concepts to their businesses in particular. Uh, something I've found with the coaching is that a lot of the best solutions don't come from me, that my role is more as a facilitator and trying to get spark a conversation and get it going. So um, I'll, I'll echo the, the mastermind um, endorsement. It's been absolutely huge in my growth. I think with this this concept of swimming downstream, of making things easier to do, the best thing you can do to sculpt your environment is to surround yourself with like-minded people who are heading in the same direction, where it becomes much easier and more natural to do the thing that everyone around you is doing. So it's, it's crucial to have people around you who you respect, who you can bounce ideas around, that uh, you're not going it alone. And I think that kind of bouncing out Bouncing ideas off other people is is a real hack, a real shortcut to avoiding making mistakes the hard way. Um, because generally everything that you're doing, someone else has done it before. And there's no reason that you can't learn from them instead. Oh, I, I think there's very few things on this planet, whether it's writing, athletics, entrepreneurship, anything. You know, someone else has always done something either exactly the same or very similar. And um, one of the catchphrases I learned last year was, you know, if she can do it, I can do it, which basically means find someone else who's done the same thing, copy the exact steps they did, but then experiment with them and uh, modify them to see, you know, which steps work for you and which ones need tweaking for your individual setup. Yeah, I like that. Um, so you help out people get to their peak state and to get beyond where they thought they could go. How, how do you achieve that? I mean, that sounds so difficult to do. I think it starts with beliefs. Um, I, I try to 
I try to expand this circle of what a person thinks they can do. And I've experienced this really powerfully in my life uh, as I do a lot of things that seemed really scary, but seem much less so after I've tried them. Uh, probably most notably, I spent a year and a half traveling around the world to exotic places on my own and just generally doing things that I never thought I could. Um, more recently, I, I perform improv comedy, and every time I get onto the stage, I feel like my heart's going to leap out of my chest. I'm a, you know, I'm an introvert and kind of tend to to stay behind the scenes. So doing something that's, uh, I'm I'm so exposing myself. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of improv is just reacting and having whatever the first thing that comes out, come out, which sometimes can be very scary and um, embarrassing if you're not used to it because who knows what's gonna come out. But it's expanding this range of what we're capable of, what we're possible. And that has to be done slowly and with beliefs. Uh, a big part of that for me is helping clients start to measure their output. So one easy exercise that I recommend everyone do is just to measure where all your time goes in a day. So some, some limiting belief on, I'd like to try that, but I just don't have the time. And you'll find all, this, all these pockets of time that you didn't know you have just by measuring. Um, well, and, and if you look at other entrepreneurs who manage to do whatever that thing you don't have time for, First of all, either they have time for it or they figured out a system or a delegation to someone else who gets the task done for their business. Mm -hmm. uh, another really easy one, uh, and this is something that anyone can do, is trying to think back to past peak states. So everyone's had a, mo a moment in their lives where everything was firing on all cylinders. Um, for me, that was, you know, when I was at the peak of my poker career where I was firing on cylinders because I had to. And going back to that time where you're operating at your peak and trying to distill down any lessons, essentially, like, what were you doing then that you're not doing now? Like, any obvious things. So, for my example, a lot of the things that I implement from that time is like, oh, wow, I was delegating all of these things that I'm now doing myself. Maybe I should treat my time as if it's valuable and start delegating these things. Um, I was being, you know, very clear about my time and my schedule and saying no to things that I wasn't really excited about. Maybe I should be more intentional about that, et cetera. Kind of the, the most obvious advice is the advice that's already worked for you in the past. Um, and another way you can look about, look about that is there are already activities in your life that you're operating at your peak. So if you play sports, taking aspects of getting into uh, that state of mind you need to perform in sports and applying it to your work. Uh, if you love cooking, how can you get into that really process orientation where you're just um, drowning out the world and single tasking and focusing on that? How can you apply that to your day-to-day -day work? Taking what you do really well and what works for you in other pursuits and applying those lessons to your job, to your work, and to other aspects of your life that don't feel like there should be a one-to-one -one relationship, but all of these lessons are transferable. So take, in essence, taking what already worked or has, take what already works or has worked and applying it elsewhere. That, that is pure genius because everyone is good at some area of their life. And anything we want to improve in another area, we can see, okay, how do I do well in this area, whether it's health or work or relationship, and how can I reapply that in the area I want to improve? So I, I love that idea, Chris. And also, you, you mentioned with improv that you know, you, you're on the stage and you've just got to speak what the first thing that comes to your mind and then you know everyone goes with it and you and there's some structure there right the yes and and other things so that you don't stop the flow uh of the improv and i think that applies to intuition too that when we're first learning to hear our intuition you know it's difficult to just listen or get the messages from our intuition and not criticize them or not stop the flow is that what you found when you listening to your own intuition or Absolutely. The, the concept uh, that applies to improv is yes and, where you don't deny what's come up. You say yes, 
and then you ask, if this is true, what else is true? So when you have an idea pop up from your intuition, which feels out of tune from the rest of the story, uh, rather than denying it, looking at, okay, well, let's say hypothetically this is true. This is something to investigate. What else could be true? What else is this related to? And this is how you kind of marry the rational thought with the intuition is you look at intuition as potential inquiries for rational thought, um, where it's, it's a way of, uh, I think of emotions as kind of communicating with the system one unconscious thought that's happening and kind of accessing in a way, it's like a, a pathway to it, if you will. But it's, it's like ideas where if you don't implement your ideas, you'll stop having them. If you don't listen to these thoughts and emotions that come up, you'll stop having them and you won't have that access. So it's important to address them and treat them as real um, in order for them to keep coming. I, I think that's so true. I, I sometimes think that intuition is like a quiet friend sitting in the car with me and she is you know, whispering clever ideas and insights to me. But so often we have the radio turned way up and we don't even hear what she's saying. And she's actually telling us, you know, you need to turn left at this road here because we're getting lost, you know, or we need to, you know, re-examine this person we hired because there's something off here. Um, so definitely good to, to create that space. And then the other thing is, just like you said, the more we take action on our intuition, the more, and that action could be as simple as, you know, deciding to make a phone call to investigate it further. It doesn't have to be move halfway across the world tomorrow, but it could be phone a friend who lives halfway across the world to check it out. I love that analogy of the radio being turned up because we have this mental chatter when we're meditating or when we're just sitting there in the rare, rare time that we aren't stimulized. The the tendency is to drown it out, to think about something else, to flinch away. But rather, if we turn into it and listen to what this chatter says, usually there's an important message, even if the message is just that we're anxious or afraid or something and that there's things that need addressing. Um, on, on literally turning this radio down so you can hear your intuition, uh, I recommend anyone who hasn't tried it do uh, a float at a sensory deprivation tank. Uh, it's something I love to do to brainstorm uh, ideas or to try to get at a really tough, important decision where I'm having a hard time getting a handle on all the criteria involved because there literally you have nothing but you and your thoughts and you're, fo you're forced to kind of confront these things that pop up rather than flinching away. So just for people who've never been in a sensory deprivation tank, it's basically a large tank with filled with warm, salty water that you float in and your eyes are covered and your ears are plugged up. So there's no, you don't, you can't hear anything, you can't feel, feel anything, can't see anything. All you've got is what's going on in your mind. Absolutely. It's just a ex exploration of inner space. And, and maybe somewhat analogous to what I know some entrepreneurs have done, which is that for, for Passana meditation retreat, where you go off for a number of days, usually 10, and all you do is sit and meditate and deal with the, the crap that comes up or the inspirations that come up. Yeah, I think it's it's a theme. I mean, I, I'm sure you're very much in uh, agreement on this, but... Uh, as we move forward into the future, a, a key differentiator with people will be not the level of their output, but the quality of their thought. And a lot of that comes down to being mindful and generating unique ideas. So, yeah, I think the quote unquote trend of meditation isn't going anywhere soon. And uh, Getting in on this understanding of yourself and this ability to listen. Um, the analogy I like to use with clients who are very ripe raid is you're building this muscle of focus that meditation isn't about focusing, it's about bringing the focus back. And that's a skill that will be extremely useful and even more so as our attention becomes infringed upon. Uh, I, won't, I won't go down that rabbit hole too much, but yeah, this ability to have self-control and to direct your thoughts is 
extremely crucial and become even more so as we move forward. So I, I just want to echo that. You, you were saying meditation is not about being able to, quote, meditate well or silence the mind. It's the ability when your mind goes off track that you generally bring it back to the whatever the focus of the meditation is, whether it's breath or something else. Yes. I, I love that. And I, I also, you know, coming back to that car analogy where you've got the radio turned up and you've got the little voice from your, you know, younger friend who's the wise voice of intuition quietly whispering. Often in the entrepreneurial mobile, we not only have the radio turned up with the distractions of Twitter and Facebook and email and, you know, whatever else we have going on, but we also have our best buddies drive and determination in the car who are very loud. <laughs> and it's, it can be hard to hear our intuition when, you know, we're so focused on, on where we're going and not so focused, are we going in the right direction? And that's the importance of unplugging and stepping away, having a very clear work-life separation, where if you're constantly listening to this drive and determination, you could easily be driving very quickly in the wrong direction. And you've probably read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits or heard of it. Um, he has a quote in there where, you know, these people, the drive and determination are sharpening the knives as they cut a path through the jungle and they're really efficient and they have great management techniques and they've got all these, you know, hacks and whatever for cutting the, the roadway through the jungle fast. And then the, the person who, who is a little more meditative climbs up a tree and says, hey, guys, we're in the wrong jungle. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah. So anything else you want to share with our listeners before we wrap this up, Chris? Wow. Yeah, we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, that was that was fun. Uh, no, I think I've I think I've gone on long enough. Um, uh, let's see. How would I how would I summarize what we were talking about? I would say I would say if you could take one thing away from our conversation, it's to listen to yourself when it comes to understanding what's important and to go about the problem of how can you get at this? How can you do this important thing? How can you move towards your goals? Come at it from a lot of different ways. And yeah, don't be afraid to listen to your intuition because it has very valuable things to tell you. And if any of our listeners' intuitions are telling them that they should check you out further, how would they find you? Yeah, I'd love that. Um, I love talking about this stuff. So please, if anything I said today resonated or you thought was ridiculous and you want to continue the conversation, I'd love to hear from you. Um, my site is sparksvc.com, S-P-A-R-K-S-V-C.com. Uh, by the time this comes out, I might have launched my new professional site, which is theforcingfunction.com. Um, you can also find me on all the various social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. My handle is Sparks Remarks. So my last name just rhymed. Uh, and yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Well, I, I really appreciate you being on the show. I'm so looking out to your book coming out in April. And uh, it's been a pleasure exploring peak performance with such a, uh, an expert. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you uh, having me on today. Get strategies and show notes at intuitiveleadershipmastery.com. What would it take to see you here next time on the Intuitive Leadership Mastery Podcast?